You said the word narrative, and I think we have lost the narrative. Mm. We, don't, we have no narrative. Where are we going? What's the point of it all? If you don't have a narrative, you don't have meaning. If you don't have meaning, you don't have identity. You have anxiety and you have uh, entitlement and you have deep grief and fear of death, by the way. Excuse me mentioning the unmentionable. Yeah, that's an interesting. But uh, death yeah. is unmentionable. And why? Because we have no hope. Now, as I've listened to you teach and argue and present over the years, uh, not wanting to blow your trumpet too much, but I've always been struck by your great knowledge and intellect and thoughtfulness and clarity too. Now, there'll be listeners who will be surprised by that because they will belong to that school of thought that says that uh, Christians are people who have left their minds at the door. There'll be others who will see that as uh, a ridiculous characterization. Um, but the point I just want to draw out for a moment is this. Uh, finding the truth about God surely can't boil down to a simple question of intellect. I mean, some of the most intelligent people I know re reject totally the idea of the resurrection. Some of the most yeah. intelligent people I've ever met believe passionately the re that the resurrection happened. True. It's, it's a nonsense to say that bright people don't believe it because there are bright people who do. No. People with much greater minds than me. But the point is that surely it's not just a matter of intellect. I mean, as the scriptures themselves say, there's a certain sort of knowledge that just puffs up. There's another sort of knowledge that, uh, that, that builds up or that love builds up. So where does intellect and the mind fit into to, to Christian belief? Mm. There's a subset to that. What about you know, dopey individuals like me who don't have great intellect? Is there any hope for me? And I don't say that, you know, in some sort of looking for yes. sympathy yes. point of view. I'm Thanks, just aware. Thanks. Yes, John. Yeah, no, no, there are, you know, look, I yeah. don't pretend yeah, to be, yeah. I'm not a rocket yeah. scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and John, it is interesting, isn't it? The Bible never, for example, never, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. It's the first and great commandment. And uh, the mind is certainly given an honoured place uh, in the Bible. Indeed, the Bible needs an intellectual uh, it needs a brain to read it for a start or to listen to it. Um, and you're right to say, yes, there are many of high intellect who have rejected the Christian faith, but equally there are many of high intellect who have embraced the Christian faith. So both those things are true. Why? How come? Well, because the Christian faith in the end is... is um, <laughs> I remember one of the first things I thought about being Christian and so forth was, can you prove God's existence? You know, in the, look at the books and you find there are proofs for God's existence and then there are people who say you can't and so forth and so on. But it doesn't work like that because our Christianity is about a relationship. It's about a relationship, a relationship with God who is our Heavenly Father. It's about what all relationships are about, namely disclosure. Uh, I know you because you have unveiled yourself to me. You've, you've revealed yourself to me. You've disclosed yourself to me. And as it is so, you begin to trust each other, or not, as the case may be, but you trust each other, you listen to each other, you do things together. Is your intellect involved? Of course. How could it be otherwise? The whole person is involved. But it is a relational matter. And I think... One of the reasons why people sometimes use their intellects, as I would say, as an excuse, really, is because we don't want to relate to God. Because we know, we think we know, that if we relate to God, he'll take our freedoms away. And we want to be free. And so, therefore, it's not so much that it's impossible to leave God because of intellect. It's rather impossible to believe in God who demands your worship and who seeks to relate to you as God. So intellect, yeah, I've had my doubts. I've been through, when I was at theological college, I, in the second year at theological college, I went through a great period of doubt, intellectual doubt. Um, and no one panicked. That was good. And gradually I began to see, ah, oh, that's how the pieces fit together. And uh, you can't live in this world without doubts. I do. Um, 
But on the other hand, I also live in a world in which I know God because he has made himself known to me and he is the one I trust more than anyone else in the whole world. So talking of those doubts, I mean, the reality is, if you don't mind me saying so, you've now lived through quite a bit through the 60s and did you talk about it earlier through the 70s. You were actually educated in some of the, the great, to go back to that word, secular institutions like mm -hmm. Sydney University mm -hmm. and uh, Oxford. You maintained your faith through all of that. So why today, sitting here, do you still say, I am a Christian? Yeah. Because there are some who aren't, of course. Some people I started the race with have fallen away. Others have joined, but... John, I think I would say this, that I'm not a Christian because I'm a good person. On the contrary, I'm a Christian because I'm not a good person and I know I need forgiveness. I'm not a Christian because I'm a highly intellectual person, which you've overstated, though I do have brains and I have been to these great universities and I have read all the other books I've read the books against as well as the books for Bertrand Russell, why I'm not a Christian. In the end, I'm a Christian because um, of Jesus Christ. I've read his story. I've read it in the four Gospels. I keep reading it. Um, I can find no other explanation for him and for what he did and said then that he is who he said he was, which is the Son of God come amongst us to save us, to forgive us. There's a great, there's an extraordinary moment when he is crucified, you know. Fortunately, the Bible doesn't really describe crucifixion. Uh, unspeakable, a horror unspeakable. And Jesus says, as he's being crucified, Father, he prays to his God, Father, forgive them. He prays for the forgiveness of those who have nailed him up, stripped him off and left him to the birds. Well, there's another moment when uh, a leper comes, uh, lepers were treated, you know, stay away, stay away, stay away. This leper arrives and he asks for healing from Jesus. And just incidentally, incidentally, the story goes, Jesus looks at him and touches him. He did what no one else would do. He touched the leper. And that in a million other ways, as I read the gospel, I'm reading about a real man. I'm reading things that he really said. I'm reading things he really did. He wasn't mad. He wasn't evil. He is the son of God. And that's, I, I just trust him. Trust, mm -hmm. incredibly powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Peter, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you indeed for being so incredibly open. And thank you for all of the challenging of so many of us uh, that you've done uh, in order that we might think more clearly and arrive at more sensible places. John, thank you for having me here. I've been much appreciated and I tune in to these uh, wonderful podcasts and I just hope and pray that they'll continue and continue to be such a huge blessing to many people. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.